right, let's climb on in the driver's seat. Good day, Jaffa Adventures. Terry King, welcome to the channel. I'm behind the wheel of my Land Cruiser 200. I've got Toyota TechStream at the moment recording engine data, particularly my inlet air temperature and charge air temperature, because I'm going to service and clean the intercooler. And I want to see whether I get an efficiency increase once that process is finished. If you're as interested in those results as I am, stick around. Now before I do the clean, I've obviously got to set a baseline. So I'm driving down the road at the moment, 80 kilometers an hour, no load on the motor, and these are the sort of results that I'm getting. Now I will summarize all of this data at the end of the video in a spreadsheet, but I just thought I would share with you the process that I'm going to do. So I'm going to run the car 80 kilometers an hour, steady speed on a flat road. Then I'm going to do a series of zero to 100 accelerations flat to the floor. What I'm trying to do there is put the engine under maximum load so that I get maximum charge air temperatures and hopefully we'll be able to draw some conclusions on that intercooler clean when we're under maximum load. Because I suspect under normal driving conditions we're not going to see much of a difference at all. All right, here's pull number two from zero. 60, 80, 100, 140. Now I've just got my foot off the throttle and we're just coasting back down. To understand why you might want to flush and clean your intercooler, it helps to understand exactly what the thing is and why you need it. Let's have a look at how your engine gets its air and what it does with it when it does get it. You'll have an air intake system. On this car, I've got a snorkel with a pre-filter. That runs through the inner guard into the air box where it's filtered again through a secondary filter. The clean air then runs down this pipe in behind this cover. Let's pull this cover off and find out what happens from there. It's held in place with two 10 millimeter cap nuts. This cover then just lifts up and pulls towards you. And voila, off it comes. The air then heads into this intake system towards the engine and the engine is basically just like a giant air pump. It splits off into these two hoses. One goes to the right turbo bank, one goes to the left turbo bank, and there the air is compressed. It then comes back from the turbo into the intercooler. Right turbo bank comes in here, left turbo bank comes in here, into the intercooler, flows through the intercooler from front to back, and then drops down into the intake system of the car. Once it's in the intake of your car, it's mixed with something to make it go bang, either petrol or diesel, depending on your car. From there, the exhaust gases leave the combustion chamber, go back through the turbo and spin it up, and then out through the exhaust. So why does the intake air get hot? Well, in non-forced induction vehicles, it really doesn't, not much anyway. The air goes directly through the filter into the intake system. On forced induction cars, however, things with superchargers or turbochargers, that's where you will typically see an intercooler. In the case of this vehicle, there's two turbochargers which are used to compress the air, and when you compress air, you generate heat. Now remember back in school when you were focused on throwing spitballs at your mate rather than listening to the teacher? Well, this is the kind of cool shit that you missed out on. That there is the ideal gas law equation. P equals pressure, V equals volume, N equals the amount of the gas, R is a constant for each individual gas, and T equals temperature. Let's assume we don't change the gas, so we can cross that one out, and let's assume we're talking about the same amount of gas, we can cross that one out. We then get P, V equals temperature. Pressure times volume equals temperature. And of course you can spin that around to temperature equals pressure times volume. Now we're looking at our turbocharger, which increases pressure. So let's plug in some numbers on this equation. 
Let's use one unit of pressure. Let's use one unit of volume. So temperature equals one unit of temperature. Let's say we compress our air like we do inside of a turbocharger, increase that pressure to two units of pressure. Our volume hasn't changed because the turbocharger system and the entire intake system is a closed system, so there's no change in volume. That means our temperature has gone up by two units as well. So increasing our pressure increases our temperature, which is exactly the reason that you need an intercooler to pull that heat that you've generated through that compression process. While we're nerding out, interestingly enough, this equation works for fridges as well. How's a fridge work? It's got a compressor which compresses the fridge gases. So when that happens, this happens, temperature goes up. You know that fan blowing on the back of your fridge that blows away hot air? That's blowing it through a heat exchanger and getting rid of some of that excess temperature. Now what are you left with after that? Well, you've got gas that's inside of a closed system that's higher pressure. That gas then flows through an orifice or through a valve. It's allowed to expand, and when it expands, it cools. Why is that? Back to our ideal gas law equation. We've got two units of pressure. Our volume hasn't changed, so T is our temperature. We then take that pressure and we drop it. As that gas passes through the orifice or through the valve and it's allowed to expand, pressure drops down to one. Volume has not changed, that's still at one. So our temperature comes down. And that's the cool kind of shit you missed in school when you weren't paying attention. The other reason that the intake air gets hot, particularly in turbocharged applications, is because the exhaust gases and the intake gases are very close together. And when those two gases get that close to one another, you're gonna get convection between the hot exhaust gases and the cool inlet air, and that's going to heat that inlet air up on you. Now you might be saying, why bother cooling the air at all? An engine can run on hot air, can't it? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely it can. But cool air is more dense than hot air. What that means is we can jam more air into the combustion chamber, mix it with a little bit more fuel, which means we get a lot bigger bang. What's a bigger bang mean? Bigger bang means more power, and we love power. Also, the cooler the air, the less thermal load that there is on the motor. Less thermal load means the engine runs a little bit more efficiently, means there's less stress and wear on the wear parts, and that in turn increases the longevity of your motor. Excess heat is an enemy of an internal combustion engine. For all those reasons, cooler air is better than warmer air, which is why manufacturers fit an intercooler to a car to get that charge air temperature down. So what is an intercooler? Well, what it is is exactly what it sounds like. Inter means between, cooler, means cooler, so it's a between cooler. In this Land Cruiser's case, it's simply a cooler between the turbos, which are mounted down there, and your engine. And it's simply designed to cool the charge air that goes into your engine. The way that it does that is exactly the same way your radiator works. You've got these cooling fins, your charge air runs through your intercooler from this end to that end, and cool air from the outside atmosphere runs through the intercooler and you get cooling through convection. On these 200 series, the air that runs through the intercooler to cool the charge air comes through these two ducts here, which run through your grill, up here, into the duct, and through the intercooler. In my case, I've also mounted a bonnet scoop on the car, so I've got a little bit of extra oomph with the air coming through the bonnet down here and then through the intercooler. This intercooler is called a top mount intercooler because it's mounted on the top of the motor. You can also get front mount intercoolers, which are mounted usually in front of the radiator. There's pros and cons for both. The biggest con on a top mount intercooler is that you get heat soak. So you've got a hot engine sitting below the intercooler and that heat through convection can get up and actually start to warm up your intercooler, which reduces its efficiency, of course. So if the intercooler is being fed clean air that's passed through your engine filter and the system is completely sealed, how the heck do these things actually get dirty inside and lose efficiency? To understand that, we'll pull this intercooler off and we'll have a look because we'll be able to expose some of these pipes and they'll be a little bit easier to see. Start off with, we gotta pull these two inlet air tubes off. They're just held on with a 10 millimeter hose clamp. All right, both hose clamps off. 
Now there are four bolts holding the intercooler down, four mounting bolts, two here on the front, which are a breeze to get to. Now to get two of the mounting bolts for the intercooler on the back, you gotta get this little sucker out of the way. And it's got two 10 mil bolts holding it on. And there's number two. Got him. Now you can see that bolt is exposed. All right, that sucker's a 12 mil. And of course it tightens up right at the end of its stroke, doesn't it? All right, that bolt's 20 miles long. And we got one more on the other side. Got him. Okay, now we gotta take the bolts off that run into the inlet manifold. There's two on this inlet pipe and there's two on the inlet pipe on the other side. You'll need a socket with a wobble on it to get them. There's one of the little boogers. There's the other one. So that's the left-hand side. Now the right-hand side is actually a little bit easier to get to. There's one. There's number two. Now that intercooler is basically ready to come off. What I've got to do is get these hoses off. I've already got the hose clamps off, so I just got to pry the hose off. And then once we get these hoses off, we're going to shift it forward only a couple of inches. And there's a couple of plugs at the back of the intercooler we've got to take off. All right, there's one hose. Now this one's a bit trickier to get to because we've got other hoses in the road. Okay, there we go. Okay, we'll pull the intercooler forward just a little bit. Lift it up off those studs. There we go. Now I've got two plugs and one hose to get off. I'm going to start with that plug there, which is our air temperature sensor. Okay, I got those two plugs off and the one hose off, but it was not easy. You need little teeny tiny hands to get back there. But once I get this inner cooler out of the road, I'll show you exactly what we're after. So this is the back of the intercooler. This is the top face. That's the charge air temperature sensor. That there is the map sensor. And on the bottom of the map sensor is this little plug here where a hose sticks onto. On the back here, that's our map sensor plug. That's our inlet air temperature sensor plug. And that's our little hose that goes onto the map sensor. All right, now that I've got the intercooler off, it's a little bit easier to see the path of the air. Filtered air comes through here, splits, down to each of the two turbos. The turbos compress the air. They come back up here and here through that inner cooler and then in into the inlet manifold through here. One here and one chamber over on the left-hand side. So now let's ask the question, how does that inner cooler actually get dirty inside? And to understand that, you need to understand this, the PCV system or the positive crankcase ventilation system. So during the combustion process, you get the big explosion in the combustion chamber, it pushes the piston down, and a small amount of those combustion gases get past the piston ring and into the crankcase. Now, if you didn't vent those gases, they'd build up inside of that crankcase and it would blow oil seals out. Not something that you want. Back in the bad old days, you simply vented the rocker cover straight down the chassis rail. In the new modern days now, you've got PCV systems, which take those crankcase gases, and in this case of the Toyota, it takes that and it routes that into this pipe here, which goes down into your inlet manifold. That inlet manifold goes down to the turbo, turbo compresses the air, the air comes up here and into your intercooler. So all of those gases that have oily vapors in them go through this system and straight into your intercooler. And that leads me on to the subject of a catch can. So what does a catch can actually do? In this particular instance, we've got our positive crankcase ventilation valve here. Gases, we've got crankcase gases, which are laden in oil. They run through this line over to our catch can. There's filter medium inside of that catch can that separates the oil from the pressurized gases, then sends it back down a return line. And that goes back into the inlet pipe 
where the original factory PCB vented into. So in simple terms, basically you're taking that oil-laden vapors, you're rerouting them through a filter, that filter drops all the vapors out of it, then you're venting those oil-free gases back into your inlet system, exactly where Toyota had them originally. So I've had a catch can fitted to this vehicle since it was 70,000 kilometers old. It's now got 200,000 on the clock. So this catch can has been on the vehicle for 130,000 kilometers. I service it every 5,000 kilometers. And this is what I pull out of the catch can on a typical 5,000 kilometer interval. That means I've serviced it 26 times since I installed that catch can. I pull about 60 milliliters out of that catch can on each service. So let's do the mass together, shall we? 26 services by 60 milliliters, 1560. So what that means is I've captured 1.5 liters of that toxic goo over the last 130,000 kilometers. If I did not have a catch can fitted, that 1.5 liters would have gone straight through my intercooler and straight through my intake system. Now, if you've got that 1.5 liters of black goo going into your motor and you've got an EGR system, which these Toyota cars do, it combines a little bit of sooty exhaust with that 1.5 liters of goo and you can imagine what black soot and oil would turn into. It's this viscous mass of crap. Now, I've got a blank off plate fitted to this car, so the EGR system is basically inoperable or inactive in it. But if you don't have that, your intake system after the EGR valve is going to be clogged up with that black goo. And there's plenty of videos on YouTube showing that. So as I've said, 70,000 kilometers is when I fitted the catch can to this. That means that there would have been 14 5,000 kilometer service intervals before I put the catch can on it, which means 840 milliliters of black goo went through that intercooler before I put the catch can on it. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason I'm going to clean this intercooler out. Now you might be saying, so what? Who cares whether there's a little bit of oil inside your intercooler? Well, just have a think about that for a second. What's an intercooler? It cools the air through convection. It's aluminium, so it's really, really good at convection. However, if you were to coat that aluminium with some oil, which is actually an insulator, the convection efficiency of that device decreases significantly. Use your finger as an example. Blow on your finger. You get a cool breeze over your finger. Now stick that finger in a little bit of oil and blow over top of it again. I bet what you'll find is that you don't even feel a temperature change. And the reason for that is that oil is an insulator. So the reason I'm going to clean that intercooler is that it is coated on the inside with insulation. All right, I got myself a white rag here. I'm just gonna stick it inside of this pipe here and give it a little bit of a wipe. And there you can see evidence of oil inside the intake system. I rub my hand in here, which is, goes into the intake system. I don't know whether you can see that shininess, but that shininess, that's all oil. Now after examining this intercooler on the bench for a little bit, there are a couple of things that I've noted. One, she's been repaired before, so the sucker has been off. Two, it looks like there's a very slight bit of oil here. So either that's from a little bit of tire shine that I've used to clean the engine bay up, or I've actually got a weep in that intercooler. So I'll be able to test that when I fill this up with cleaning fluid. The last thing that I've noted is it is very, very clean inside. I am absolutely stoked with that. You saw a little of the black crap on the rag that I had, but that was really pretty minimal. I am very, very pleased with how clean that is on the inside, and this is before I've cleaned it. I put that down to that catch can. Now I'm gonna take that air temperature sensor out of there because I don't wanna damage that when I fill this up with cleaning fluid. Hey, there's our temperature sensor. Now I'm going to try and make the two ports on this inner cooler as fluid tight as I can so that it just helps make cleaning a little bit easier. I know this won't be a perfect seal, but it'll certainly do for my purposes. I'm just going through with a very small pick and any of these small fins that are bent over from bug impacts or stone impacts or whatever it has been. 
just bending them straight again. Will it make a difference to the efficiency of the intercooler? Probably not, but it can't hurt. Now I've got that port, that port, and that port taped up. That port is left open. Put a blank off plug here where the temperature sensor went. Don't need to do anything with the map sensor because it doesn't actually go into the interior of the intercooler. And we're ready to clean this intercooler. Now what should I use to clean that intercooler? Well, it's got oil in it, right? So I want something that will cut oil and cut oil really, really, really easily. Two, I want to be able to buy it in bulk. Three, it needs to be relatively cheap. And four, it needs to volatilize off easily so that it dries out with no residue. That sounds like petrol, doesn't it? Absolutely. Now, the other thing I'm going to do before I go ahead and flush this out, I'm going to clean that little bit up there with some brake cleaner. Because when this petrol gets in here, if there is a leak there, I'll be able to see that petrol weeping past that point quite easily. Because as you probably know, petrol gets into all sorts of nooks and crannies very, very easily. Okay, time to fill her up. Look out, Sunny. All right, I can see the petrol here in the bottom. So I'll pop my hand over that and I'll swoosh it around before I fill it up and top it up completely. That's good, I can see that petrol is nice and black, so it's pulling shit out of there. And my seal don't work, what a surprise. I wanna hold the petrol in this location so that, it's, so that I can see whether it's leaking past that point that I cleaned. And it doesn't look like it is at all. So that was probably just a little bit of tire shine that I used to clean up. And that is what's come out of it. Okay, there is a little sample of the petrol that came out of the intercooler after the flush. And that's black. It definitely pulled some shit out of that intercooler. No ifs, ands, or buts. When I was doing the flush, I didn't have any petrol weeping from any of the seams on this thing. So that's a good thing. Now I've taken off all of my blank off plates off the intercooler inlets. I'll pull out this bung where the temperature sensor goes and I'll set this sucker out in the sunshine for a few hours and let it dry out. Sweet. And of course, there's where our temperature sensor goes. I won't put that in there until this intercooler is completely dried out. All right, I've left that intercooler out in the sun all day. Now it's late afternoon. I've got a fan blowing into that end. Ooh, and if I stick my nose in there, still a lot of petrol fumes coming out of there. So I'm gonna let that run overnight, and then I'll put my sniffer in there tomorrow morning and see whether I've got rid of all those petrol fumes. That fan has been blowing overnight. Let me stick my sniffer in here. Ah, beautiful. Nothing but fresh air coming out of there. Let's whack this intercooler back on. All right. Now the trickiest bit by far is getting that little tiny hose on the map sensor. You can get your hand in there, but it's not easy. Especially if you've got big fat claws like I do. And when you're done, you're probably going to be all carved up like I am as well. But it is possible. Just keep at it installation is just a reversal of the removal process. You guys have already done this. You've already pulled it off. You're smart people, so you know what needs to be done to put it back together. For that reason, I'm not going to provide a step-by-step -step instructions. Well, after about 10 minutes of grunting and groaning, we got there. Intercooler back in place. Gonna tighten her down for good. Head out on the road and we're gonna test this sucker again. Back on the road now to do my post intercooler clean testing. I got TechStream running at the moment and we're heading out to my test area, which is basically a back road that nobody uses except for the hoons, as you can tell by the skid marks all over the road, none of which are mine. The climactic conditions that I've got today are virtually identical to what they were before I cleaned the intercooler. Sixty-five seconds. Eighty-eight seconds. 
111 seconds. 120, 15. 140, 21 seconds. Okay, let's have a look at our results here, shall we? The conditions that I tested was a baseline, no load, 80 kilometers an hour before we did the pulls. Then I did four pulls, zero to 140 kilometers an hour. And then I did a baseline, 80 kilometers an hour, no load, after the pulls. And I've recorded those inlet air temperatures before the clean and after the clean. And all of these numbers are in degrees Celsius. So let's just have a look at this pull one, for example. The inlet air temperature was 20 degrees, the charge air was 64, which means the change or the delta was 44 degrees. So there was a 44 degree temperature difference between the inlet air temperature and the charge air. Now if we look at that same pull after we did the clean, we've got a delta of 43 degrees. So we've improved the efficiency of the intercooler by one degree Celsius in that pull one. I've also recorded the coolant temperature across all these pulls just to make sure that there wasn't any wide variability in that. And as we can see from these numbers, there isn't. So what sort of conclusions can we draw here? Well, one thing we can see is that we've got heat soak in the intercooler. So before the pulls, we were getting a charge temperature of 30 degrees and 29 degrees before and after the clean. And after the pulls, it was 36 degrees and 35 degrees. So we've got a much hotter engine here, and there's been some heat soak into that intercooler. The results across all four pulls was very consistent. So that gives me confidence in drawing conclusions. There was an improvement in the efficiency before and after the clean, but that improvement was very marginal. We've gone from a charge air temperature maximum of 64 odd degrees down to a charge air temperature of 63 degrees. So basically we've pulled one degree Celsius before and after the clean. And that holds true in our baseline pulls as well. Now that the job is finished, will I be adding that to my regular service intervals, say every 100,000 kilometers or so? And for me, the answer is no. The reason for that is I've got that catch can fitted and I'm confident that that catch can is catching the majority of those crankcase vapors and preventing them from going through the intercooler. And that's backed up by the actual cleanliness of the intercooler that I saw in this car when I pulled it off. So am I glad that I did the clean itself? The answer to that is an absolute yes. For one, it allowed me to peer inside of that intake system and I was very, very happy with how clean it was. For me, the more I know about the overall condition of my vehicle, the more comfortable I am. Ignorance is not a playing field that I like to run out on. Two, I had that opportunity to replace the map sensor filter, and I know now that that map sensor is operating at peak efficiency. I've cut another video on that subject, and it was quite interesting to find that that map sensor filter was starting to pick up materials and could have been heading on its way to getting clogged. Thirdly, I did get a marginal improvement in the intercooler efficiency. Like you saw in the video, it was only one degree, but it was an improvement, so I'll take that improvement to the bank. And lastly, of course, I just love geeking out on this sort of shit. Now, would I recommend that you do this particular clean on your car? And that is a hugely subjective question. I don't know your mindset as it relates to maintenance of vehicles, nor do I know your capability set. Also, I don't know the age and the condition of your vehicle and your motor. Having said all of that, if your vehicle has over 100,000 kilometers on it and you do not have a catch can fitted, I would be doing it. In that time, you've had over 1.2 liters of that oily residue passing through your intercooler and your intake system. If your car was fitted with a catch can from new or near new and you maintained that catch can regularly, I'd say no. My experience shows that that catch can catches most of those oily vapors and the cleanliness and therefore efficiency of your intake system is probably pretty good. But that's just my opinion and opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. The difference with my opinion is I like to back it up with some empirical data, which I trust you got out of this video. If nothing else, hopefully it's opened your eyes up a little bit and it has prompted you to ask a couple of questions of yourself. If that's occurred, job done. Heaps more of these tech videos coming your way. In the meantime, look after one another and keep the shiny side up. Bye now.